Pia Ursula, thank you so much for inviting me here to your praxis, your beautiful praxis, close to the Black Forest. Uh, as you know, this is a series titled Breakfast at Kuznak, and I'd like to interview Lindens, linked to the Carl Gustav Jung Institute in Zurich. For me, it's very interesting to be here because you are an expert on the I Ching or the I Ching. But before we get to the I Ching, I would like to ask you the question I always start with. Who was Carl Gustav Jung? Or better, who was, who is your own Carl Gustav Jung? Well, my own Carl Gustav Jung is the one who, um, who discovered the collective unconscious and who had this uh, close friendship with Richard Wilhelm and um, was the one who opened the psychological door for the work with the I Ching. So this is what he is personally for me and of course he is the one who developed his own psychology and his own appro approach about psychology which is very much connected of how I can understand by myself the psyche. What could be Carl Gustav Jung's relevance today at the beginning of the 21st century? Well, you see, lots of this um, modern psychotherapy approaches, like this schema therapy, are somehow connected with Jungian ideas. Uh, because the schema therapy is uh, very much um, orientated to what um, Jung discovered or developed with the complexes, the complexes. And uh, so lots of his ideas can be renewed and reworked in our times. And it is still a very, um, a very interesting and a very helpful and a very supportive therapy approach. And this is what we can use today and what we can make out of it today. Jungian psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts are very fond of dreams. Mm -hmm. What are dreams? I would say dreams are your personal, very individual mirror. And it's a, a mirror with, with many dimensions. So you can look in the surface and then you see all your relationship problems. So the dream is compensating what you're actively um, have in your life now. But then you can go deeper and you can see the deeper levels of your psyche, images that belong really personally to your psyche and what you individually are. So, and this is the best source of uh, meeting oneself in the dream. And you can take it or you can leave it. It's just, it's not something that is overwhelming you. Okay, sometimes they are nightmares, but usually the dream is just coming and you can try to understand it or not. But anyhow, it's helpful. How to understand it? Can we understand it by ourselves or do we always need somebody else? Well, it's easier to have somebody else. And it's easier to have somebody supporting you to, to read these images of the psyche, um, but not influencing you. And this is why we as Jungians do all this symbolic work, to understand the different symbolic meaning of the, of, of the dreams and connect it to your individual experience. So this is why it is very helpful to have somebody you trust to talk with. Um, and during the process of analysis, uh, sometimes you get an idea, you get a glue about your own inner pictures. And this helps you to step by step understand your own dreams. So of course I would say it's helpful to have somebody. And, uh, and of course it's helpful to become your own expert. You said I had nobody to tell my dreams to, mm -hmm. not even Freud. Since they parted. Yeah. Um, but in May 1929, Richard Wilhelm sent to you Golden Flower. Mm -hmm. And so 
Sono Shambhasani underlines in his edited version of the Red Book, a reader's edition, that suddenly Jung stopped writing and painting the Red Book, the Liber Nobis, and started to dig deeper and deeper into the golden flower and alchemy. He met alchemy through Wilhelm, we could say. This is what Shambhasani says. Can you tell us more something about Jung and Wilhelm, mm -hmm. their relationship? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, of course we know a little about that. But what I think it was, was this was such an amazing meeting and it was such a wonderful incident that they met because Richard Wilhelm at that time, he was one of the profoundest sinologists in the old Chinese classic world, classical works. And he gained um, a deep wisdom during his studies when, because he stayed for 25 years in China. And um, so he, he went very deeply in this classical Chinese material. Uh, but of course he was not a psychologist, he was a, a, a Protestant priest. And, um, but he was very open-minded and he was not, uh, he, he was not a person who tried to put things he got informations about in his own system. He was open-minded enough to look at it as a phenomenon. And uh, that's something you can see when you read his, his translations that he, uh, did not do it in, in, a, uh, in a very narrow-minded sinologist approach. He tried to understand the text in its meaning. Sometimes he put it a little bit into this Christian terminology, terminology but um, however he tried to really um, get an idea of the meaning of the text. So in this was um, um, this was his great effort, and I think this was um, something R Jung realized and, and could appreciate very much because, in in one sense, this was pure material he got, pure material he needed to uh, to include it in his own work about the about the archetypes and about the alchemy. And of course, it was a confirmation about his um, collective unconscious concept he discovered at that time. So this was really uh, an amazing synchronicity. You mentioned meaning, the concept of meaning. Shumbasani underlines, in psychotherapy, quote, Jung sought to enable his patients to recover a sense of meaning in life through facilitating and supervising their own self-experimentation and symbol creation, end of quote. This is so interesting to me because after years working on his inner side, writing, dreaming, writing, painting, meeting the secret of the golden flower or writing the comment to it, he was able to leave the inner world to find the strength to go into the outer world, mm -hmm. to present his ideas. Mm -hmm. And here it is where also he met his followers. He was not alone anymore. No, he was not alone anymore. And of course, this was why um, the I Ching was so valuable for him, because um, the I Ching describes in this 64 hexagrams complex situations. And these were uh, generations of Chinese, um, Chinese um, experts who worked on the I Ching because it was it was it is a very old book and it was continuously commented um, until let's say modern modern days, and it was not him who has to do this. It was already done. It was only the thing to. To, to see, to discover it, and to understand it in this way. By example, to understand the hexagrams in a psychologi with their psychological uh, meaning and background. 
And so this was really something, um, a good opportunity to demonstrate how psyche expresses itself in, in, uh, in this, let's say, um, philosophical um, and also very archaic source of wisdom, which is, uh, which is shown in the meeting. Jung, thanks to Theodore Klovnor, got closer and closer to alchemical texts since 1910. Mm -hmm. But he also got closer and closer, although superficially we could say, to the Asian culture. Yes. Yoga, meditation, mm -hmm. the mandalas and their center, the Tao, mm -hmm. and then the I Ching. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he's so? What was he looking for there that we in Europe couldn't find? Well, you know, in the Red Book, you mentioned the Red Book. There he had uh, a fantasy about the opposites. Um, and he was not calling it yin and yang. It was just that um, the one begets the other one. And that the one uh, creates the other side, which was the beginning also of his shadow concept. And um, he found this when he got an idea of, uh, of Lao Tzu's um, Tao Te Ching. And there, in the very first words, is a very um, precise description of the self-concept, which was also Jung's concept. And um, in this in these few words, everything is explained. The two opposites, the shadow concept, the transcendent function, and um, the, the inner subjective opposites and the outer object opposites, like the shadow and the ego, or like uh, the unconscious and the conscious. And um, this whole system is based on um, a concept of the unifying symbol and the unifying symbol uh, like we have it in this uh, in this Zen circle um, is something you find in Asian tradition and um, the Christian tradition is more orientated to the Trinity and uh, so the beginning the very first beginning in the unifying symbol which is um, significant in the circle. This was something he found in the Asian culture. Jung wrote to Wilhelm on May 25th, 1929. Fate appears to have given us the role of two bridge pillars, which carried the bridge between East and West. Jung also wrote, my acquaintance with alchemy in 1930 took me away from it, from the liber nose. The beginning of the end came in 1928 when Richard sent me the text of the Golden Flower, an alchemical treatise. There the contents of this book found their way into actuality and I could no longer continue working on it, on the liber no. mm -hmm. And then he continues, the text, Golden Flowers, gave me an undreamed of confirmation of my ideas about the mandala and the circumvallation of the center. Mm -hmm. This was the first event which broke through my isolation. I became aware of an affinity. I could establish ties with someone and something. Ursula, what is the content of the secret of the golden flower? Well, the content is um, it's a combination of the idea of entity, duality, and, um, and the quaternio, is this the word? I don't know. Uh, which means it is a very uh, impressive work on um, the, uh, the symbol of the cyphers, cipher, of the numbers. Uh, which is, of course, connected to the mandala. 
because you again have the cycle there and then you have the, uh, the quarter within the cycle. And the whole thing is based on how human being can become aware and let's say conscious within the darkness of all these um, influences that create the world and the personal being. And um, it's again, let's say, uh, an idea of how to um, how to, to, to find a position in your personal life according to your fate, which is always also mentioned in, in, in the golden flower. Um, and of course, it is a, a very interesting description of the individuation process, um, because yin and yang can be seen as anima and animus, as the anima and animus concept, like Jung developed it also. But the thing is that it, yin and yang are not well yin. Anima and animus is a concept where, where uh, very complicated concepts because they're very much well yin. Um, and this was also a problem Jung had with this concept. And in uh, the golden flower, you have the philosophy of yin and yang as qualities of the psyche and how these two qualities create each other in a sense of gaining more conscious about yourself. Consciousness about yourself. So, and let's say this is in short words what uh, the golden flower is about. Yeah. What about the I Ching? What is the I Ching? Uh, this is a bigger question. So, the I Ching says about itself that it could describe everything. It could describe everything that happens in the world. So it's um, it's a, a, a unifying um, description of everything that happens in the world. And the I Ching says that all these things that happen in the world are not chaotic. All this is happening according to a certain order. And the I Ching helps to discover this certain order. And even in terms of conflict or, um, or um, despair, something like this, it can help you to give you an idea or to find back to what your inner Tao, your inner path, your inner truth is. And it helps you to, um, to find a new position in what seems to be chaotic. Yeah. In a sense of just to try to, um, to understand the meaning of a certain situation because you get an idea of what you don't see, what you don't understand, and what you don't want to see, of course. So it helps you to find your own place within things overwhelming you. Let's try to help those listening to us to understand how it works. Mm -hmm. Imagine a patient comes to you, and this patient has a problem, mm -hmm. whatever problem. I have a job offer on the other side of the world. I don't know what to do. Shall we ask the oracle, the I Ching? Yeah. Now, interesting enough, you mentioned two things. The one thing is, uh, the I Ching helps you to find decisions, to make decisions. And you mentioned that the I Ching is an oracle. And of course, you can see the I Ching as an oracle. But um, this is not the expression we like to use in modern times because it's too obscure. Insofar, the I Ching says that it has a structure, it can give a structure and order into, let's say, chaotic things. The I Ching says that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter when you ask something. 
or how you ask something, but if you ask something, you can get a certain answer. And it's up to you to give this answer a relevance. So you can answer, you can ask your best friend this question and he'll give you an advice. And the I Ching says about him, himself, I'm like a dwell. And you can take out the fresh water out of, of this dwell or you can just pass by. So, and this is uh, when you take away the word oracle, we can say the whole thing, we are in the psychological field. Everything around us is psyche. And um, the question is, which position you find to get an answer to such a question? And if you cannot find an answer within yourself, you can use a mirror, you can use a friend, or you can use the aging. So something in this psychological field to get an advice or to get a new helpful idea, supporting idea. But with the aging, it is amazing because it's it's um, it's uh, containing this great wisdom. So it's a very wise friend you can ask. Yeah. And here again, we are at the unifying symbol. You asked, well, Jung is, Jung is coming from the Unus Mundus and from alchemy. Here again, you find it. The I Ching says everything is, everything is contained in everything. Everything is in this psychological field. And the question is how, how, which position you take to get an answer and to get an idea about it. I have an intriguing question. Does it work with everybody? Very superficial. I'm sure you have encountered, maybe not patients, but people that came to you and asked you, what is the teaching? I heard you're an expert about it. And maybe because they have a rational mind, a conscious mind, mm -hmm. they would say, come on. How does this work? Have you ever encountered somebody that was first sight against it or not able to understand and then proved that the I Ching or the Oracle, as I said, could really support you in your life? Well, you know, when somebody is coming and you're just really skeptical about it, um, then there is a little, a little, um, a little curious light within himself who wants to know it. Those who are really not interested and who really are not um, thinking about these things and interested in these questions and in this idea that I can ask a book uh, a very personal question, they won't come and, and ask me to, to do the eating or eating with them. So of course, these are always people who say, okay, I can go along with it, that I might get an answer while throwing coins or uh, doing um, um, throwing the sticks. Um, so, and this is already, let's say, um, this is already the idea of that there is something greater, a greater wisdom uh, beyond what I see. And I, I, I'm interested enough in getting uh, an answer from this side. So, and this is why when people are coming and asking and doing the eating with me, they, everybody, these pe people are really interested in it. And they're really interested in taking the risk. And again, the eating is answering in, in, in a symbolical way. Uh, with this uh, universal symbols, so everybody with some help, like dream interpretation, can understand the answer when there is a person helping them. And this is what I do: try to, to not only to translate but to discover the meaning of the symbol to the proper situation the client is coming and asking. Modern technology enable to have. I Ching on your iPhone or your smartphone. Does it work? Yes, of course it works. It doesn't matter. It's it's not important to do this ritual and, and very magic things with the coins or the sticks or uh, uh, even shaking your iPhone. 
it's uh, you also can look on an on, on an image and immediately it is meaningful to you so it's not so important how you ask the book you also can open it and then you get a hexagram um, the only thing is with throwing the coins or the sticks or, or also shaking the iPhone is that you get the lines and uh, the comment on, on the lines so it is um, a practical question of which method you use but um, to say it symbolically it doesn't matter um, when you want to swim it doesn't matter how you if you jump into the lake or if you're just uh, approaching the lake you when you want to swim you swim so when you want to ask the book just ask can you ask the same question more times um, yes you can of course you can but I know what you mean. So there's one hexagram, uh, which is very amazing and always astonishing to the people because when they are asking several times the same question, the I Ching answers that they should not bother him any longer. Uh, and this is something very amazing. And this is maybe also something very uh, obscure that it seems to really have a certain um, intelligence which um, so there are some people who are ex or working with the eating and who say this is like um, uh, like something superficially talking to you however what it is um, the eating is as if it goes into contact with you uh, in this very personal situation you are and this is so amazing and this is so helpful so you can ask several times, then sometimes you get too many answers which are confusing, confusing you. Or you can ask several times and then you get this hexagram which tells you that you should not bother the aging because it doesn't give you an, a second advice. Yeah. But there's also a hexagram and when you get the hexagram it says, please ask me uh, a second time. And then maybe the question was not the real question you have. Can we look into technique? How to formulate a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. A few minutes ago I asked you, possible patient, neighbor, friend comes to you. Yeah. You have a job offer, the other side of the work, what can I do? What is the first thing that you do? when looking at this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, when looking at this question, uh, it is, when you say, what can I do? Well, then it is, what can you do? You can do a lot, many things. What makes sense is to find a very precise question about what is really, what is really affecting you. Is it, is it interesting? Is this job interesting for you because you want to escape from a situation here? So then maybe the question would be, why do I want to leave my surrounding here? Or is the question, uh, what am I expecting about the new job on the other side of the world? Or what will be the consequences when I take this job and leave my life here? So you see, when starting with a question, there are lots of different questions behind. And this is why the question finding process is so important because then you uh, really find out what your real question and the, the, real, um, the real motivation is behind the question. And this is an important step in your personal conscious work you have to do when asking the eating, when asking the oracle, you know. So, because when you know your motivation and when you know your proper question, then uh, the eating is able to answer very precisely, very much referring to what is really affecting you. And this is the same like the dream. Yeah. So, when you you can understand uh, the dream in two ways. In a final way, 
in the sense of what is the development in the dream, what helps me to understand my situation now and gives an idea of what will develop out of this situation, or it's answering the why question. I don't like the why question very much because it does not make so much sense to explain the past. Yeah? It very often makes sense and this is again much more connected with the aging. What is the situation now? What can develop out of, of this situation? And uh, what is important for me now to, to understand, to uh, survey, to accept in the sense to be in accord of my individual development which takes part now in this situation. And this is why we can talk about the aging to be an oracle. Because the aging says, I see the seed in the situation and I can say, I can tell you something about how it will turn out, how it will develop. And this is the great relevance of the aging. And this is also the differentiation to all the other things because it is really um, referring to the proper situation. Yeah? And then you can get a very individual answer. Step one is to find the correct question. Yes. Step two mm -hmm. is to throw the coins, yes. throw the sticks, mm -hmm. open the books, yep. shake the iPhone, yep. With the coins, mm -hmm. which as far as I understand is the method you use the most, mm -hmm. how do you use it? How does it work? So um, usually you, you choose three coins, personal coins, uh, and the personal and in your coins, um, it can be coins from your currency or it can be Chinese coins, doesn't matter. Uh, it have to be three similar coins, of course. In terms of size, you mean? In terms of size and in terms of weight. And, uh, and then you begin with making a definition because the coin has two sides, usually a side where the number is mentioned, the cipher, and the other side with a weapon. And you have to give a definition to these two sides, meaning one side is representing the number three, and the other side is representing the number two. I usually give the advice that the, num the side of the uh, coin that shows the cipher represents the number three, because three is, um, um, three is the first um, irregular number, which is much more uh, dedicated to what is meant with heaven and the weapon side is representing the earth, the archetype of the earth and this is much more represented through the cipher too. So this is why I give this advice and when you found your personal definition for the two sides you go along with this during your whole life or when you are asking the gene. Um, so when you throw three coins, you get, uh, you add these, um, the ciphers you get. So you can, by example, get three times three. Then you have number, the cipher nine. And the cipher nine is um, a young nine. And, or you can throw the coins and you can get three times two. This is six. And this is a yin line. So um, the results you get are connected to yin or yang. Um, and ciphers 6 and 8 are connected to yin, and ciphers 9 and 7 are connected to yang. And 9 and 6 are changing lines, and 7 and 8 are um, staying lines. And of course, the I Ching is the book of changes. So you can see with this changing lines represented with the changing ciphers, 
um, the engine shows at which point of the situation the situation is going to change yeah? to to was it in, in a beginning new situation transforming situation yeah so you throw the coin six times six times throwing you get a hexagram because you get six lines because every time you throw the coins you get one line and when you threw it six times, you got the hexagram with the changing lines. And then you look at the book and try, and then you identify which hexagram you got. And there you read the counts. Mm -hmm. You said that there are 64 hexagrams. Yes. And now that you have not one, but two inching books. Yeah, I have the yeah. German one and the English version, so. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of how you work with it, how you support the patient with decrypting the answers, yeah. reading an hexagram? Yeah. Yes, of course I can. So I remember uh, a woman coming, she was in her middle 40s, and uh, she had serious problems with her partner. And uh, like it always is, it is a typical complex situation. She was, um, there were lots of um, emotions which were um, struggling with each other. So she was, um, she was afraid about maybe this is going to separation. She was angry with her partner. She felt she was, she felt alone, she felt helpless, she was mourning. Um, and uh, of course, you see all these different emotions are connected with different uh, experiences in her life. For example, her mourner was because she remembered another situation where she lost an important person in her life. And uh, her anger was because she felt that there is something between them uh, which is um, like um, like a blockade and that she cannot come closer to her partner and she did not know what it was. And um, her anxiety was, of course, that it will turn out to come to a separation. So she was mixed up with all these different emotions. And uh, well, of course, she wanted to ask the oracle to where the relationship um, goes to or develops to. And then I told her and then I said to her, okay, if you ask a question like this, um, maybe you think that something or this decision, this is not a decision, that um, the whole situation is influenced by a sort of fate outside of you and um, and then she said yes well I feel like this it's not it's not me anymore acting in this relationship it's all these things happening around me and then I said well but then it's um, then maybe you are too much connected to your fate or to circumstances you cannot influence and I think this is the reason why you feel so overwhelmed. And the question is, uh, what is really connected with you? What you can do in this situation so that you feel more capable? So this was the first thing, or the first um, idea that she got, that she saw, yes, I'm also a part of the situation and I cannot delegate the solution of this situation to the fate or to this book, I have to find my own way how to go along with this problem I have. And then I asked her, well, but tell me more about the problem you have. And then she talked a little bit more about the blockade. She said that they um, have this relationship and she loves this man, and but she always thinks that there is something standing in between. And her husband was divorced from his first woman 
and um, and then this was the second relationship and she said well I think um, she ne he never arrived in our relationship and uh, when I ask her what she means with arrive and she says well it is as if he's always a little bit absent okay so and then um, to shorten this a little bit I asked her what she wants to ask the Ijun. And then she says, well, my spontaneous question is, um, how will this relationship turn out in the near future? And um, then I said, well, this is what I said before. You are delegating the question to your fate. You can do this, of course, you're allowed to ask everything. But it's more helpful and more um, it's, it's more practical and more useful to yourself or yourself when you ask a very personal question. And then I said, well, I hear that you are a little bit doubting about this relationship. And then she said, yes, of course, to be honest, um, this is not the relationship I want to have. Um, and I said, well, can you try to get an idea of what question do you really have? And uh, then she said, well, maybe um, the real question is, how do I feel in this relationship right now? And um, how about my personal, emotional, energy to go along with this with this partner because she was also thinking about separation and she she was aware that she the separation uh, idea that she projected it first through her partner and then she was aware well I thought also about separation and my question is how um, how am I personally in this um, partnership and how do I personally want to go along with it okay so uh, we threw the coins and um, she got hexagram number 12 and hexagram number 12 is um, the English translation is the split the separation so the first thing was okay it is now again fate that um, it is said that they will separate. Um, so when you project it to the objective level, when you project it outside of yourself, then you can say, okay, um, the meaning of fate is separation. And then I always uh, go back to the personal, the inner motivation and the inner complex situation. And then we talked about a lot um, about her being not connected to herself, to the situation, and not connected to the partner. Because hexagram split, number 12, describes that the two powers, heaven and earth, are not coming together because the two energies are going away from each other. So the question was, what was really her inner problem of not really saying yes to who she is, um, who she is in the relationship, and also saying yes to her aggression and her anger she has towards her partner, because her aggression and anger she always took out of the situation. And we talked a lot about that aggression and anger sometimes can help to come into contact. And as long as she is in the split and uh, repressing her anger, he cannot feel her. So there is no feeling in the relationship. And no feeling leads to a split. And when she is not connected with the assume of her inner feelings, she is not connected with herself, so this is also a split. So I talked a lot about um, how this hexagram split, this complex situation, is referring to her inner psychological situation, 
to her objective relationship level and also to the objective world she's in. And then she, she came to the point that she realized that uh, this mourner aspect in the whole situation, because she was afraid that her partner uh, will leave her or that separation is coming. And that this mourner aspect is one of the first splits in her life because there she could not show and express her feelings uh, because she lost a beloved person. She could not express her feelings and she covered these feelings inside herself. And outside, she always played the nice person. And she played the nice person and she was very successful with it. But of course, this inner part was always separated. And so uh, the transforming line was uh, the line numbered the six at the beginning. And the six at the beginning says, in short words, um, when ribbon grass is pulled up, the sod comes with it. And this was exactly what was happening. She tried to pull out the grass, but what was coming with was the mourner. And she saw um, that she had to reprocess this uh, because she said, I have to refine my lost feelings because I realize now without these feelings, I cannot arrive in a true re relationship with my partner. And so she realized the blockade she projected into this situation because she said, maybe he is still connected with his former wife is a projection. It was not what is what happening with him. This was something what happened with her, that she was unconsciously connected with something happening in her life before, and which was her problem. So then this was a very long process that we worked on this inner split she had where she lost herself in this situation when she was a girl. And that she, that she could take the courage to express her proper feelings, also let's say negative feelings, there are no negative feelings, but also this not, um, not very much accepted feelings, that she could express this in her relationship and all the relationships around her. And this led to, this led to, uh, and this was a process over weeks, several weeks, and suddenly she felt more alive. Yeah, because she had more feelings. Um, uh, she was not so depressed anymore, and she was not, she was not obviously depressed. This was really a depressed a depression that would, which was very much hidden behind. And so she felt, I, I feel much more alive. And what happened was, of course, that um, she went outside and she met other men, two other men, which seemed to be very interesting. And so her partner became jealous and they got great discussion and they got great discussion about their relationship. And the whole thing, uh, led to a, a good progress in their relationship. Yeah. So you see what at the beginning could be understood as separation in the sense of that they are going to separate as a couple because he is the problem. Yeah. Went into a completely other direction that she could solve a subjective inner problem. Yeah. And then see that this separation is something meant within her and taking the responsibility for that she could solve the relationship problem so and there was no separation at all and she took the courage to talk with her partner about her first his first marriage and all the questions she had and of course she she had this mourning process with her which was her own story and the whole thing led to 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 better understanding of the situation. Usually, we store the psychoanalysis into the development of the personality, mm -hmm. of your own personality, your true personality. 
Yeah. But this story, this case you just mentioned, sounds to me a revolution. Mm -hmm. Do you believe psychoanalysis is meant for revolution? And which kind of revolution? Well, you know, revolution is a political word. And I think we unions, we would prefer to talk about transformation, changing, and, um, well, when we go back to what I described with this woman, of course it was revolutionary for her to take her projection back to see where her proper problem was. Because people avoid this, everybody of us knows. We prefer to project and we prefer to see the problem in the other. Um, so this is a sort of revolution when you are able to do that. Um, because you always have to take really your whole courage to do it. This is what Jung says, it, we, everybody does not like to meet his own shadow because his shadow is ugly. And the shadow is always challenging us. And this is also the part of when you talk about revolution, it's the challenging aspect of the whole thing. And um, challenging also means that you really have to um, go through the suffering and also go through the joy. And lots of people are afraid of being happy and to be joyous. Uh, sometimes they prefer to suffer. And this is also a sort of revolution to accept. So if I come to this point where I realize who I am in this situation this woman has, then I really feel happy and I can enjoy this progress. And sometimes this is revolutionary. Yeah. Um, because then you really get an inner standing, a new inner standing. And you must be honest to say, well, I sold something and I've got an idea or something about myself and I'm, a pro I'm proud about it. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is revolutionary, uh, but I, I would not use this word. I would say um, when you take your own chance to, um, to do this transforming process, even if it's harmful and even if it's um, shaming, and even if it's um, sometimes very sad, yeah? But there are also other feelings around it. And this is making you more feeling about who you really are in all the variety of feelings you have. And of course it helps you to find your position in the proper situation now. Yeah? Not fleeing into the past and not seeking for whatever in the future, but really um, arrive in this proper situation in your life. Yeah? And this is for me something that is really connected to a feeling of vitality. Yeah? And being connected now. Yeah. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this interview and this interesting question.